just going to go over some of the things that I discussed there, CBDCs, gold, silver, macroeconomics, UBI, uh, all that stuff. So uh, Jared says, I do have an important question that probably isn't covered normally. I will only ask if questions are open up. I mean, I don't, I don't have Vandell here yet, so I can't give you his perspective. But Jared, if you want to fire away and ask a question, um, we can open up with that. And then once Vandell gets here, we can kind of jump into the broader conversation um, and kind of take it from there. So if, if you want to go ahead and fire it off, Jared, more than happy to give you my perspective on whatever the question is. Um, thoughts on Puerto Rico tax haven or not really? Um, I mean, it is a tax haven, right? So you, you have 4% flat tax there. There's no income tax um, or capital gains. Uh, it's just a 4% flat tax if you live there. And um, I, I may just be on, on the goods you purchased there. That's how Dubai is. Um, but anyway, yeah, so you, the, the problem with Puerto Rico, and I say it's a problem, um, the infrastructure is not that great there because the taxes are so favorable. Um, things really aren't built out. So you, if you do live there and, and the price of living there has gone up substantially over the last couple of years, a lot of people move there for the tax advantages, uh, but you do have to reside there for six months out of the year in order to get those tax advantages and it has to be documented. You can't be, you know, flying back and forth. You can, but you got to make sure that you're documenting at least six months there in uh, Puerto Rico in order to get the, uh, the benefits. So if you're okay with that, if you have your own well, if you've got, you know, four or five million dollars to build a home, a buy some property, uh, that's probably a good spot. But, uh, you know, if if you're going to be living off of the infrastructure that they have there, you know, Kevin Cage moved out there and he'll go, you know, sometimes a week without water and electricity if there's a, a hurricane or something. So just be aware of that if that's something you choose to do. Um, I would rather live where I want to and uh, just use the tax code to be able to mitigate the implications that way. Um, <clears throat> Jared says, sorry for the link, but please, can you answer, can you update any operating agreement at any time with different balances and values? Um, I have an LLC and put my current value of the operating agreement, but have acquired more assets. Um, da, da, da. furthermore, does the shorter long term capital gains restart upon assets moving into the LLC wallet? Yeah. <clears throat> so this is a good question. This is a lot of, you know, a lot of people have this question. Um, so if it's a single member LLC and you own the assets previous, when you move them into the, the company, uh, when you sell them, they would have a step up in basis and change the time. I prefer gifting, uh, that, you know, doesn't cause that to happen. Um, if you gift them into the LLC, they get to maintain their basis. And then also the line, the time of, uh, the length of time that you've held the assets, uh, previous to that. So, uh, if it is a trading LLC, then you're not going to get the benefit of long-term capital gains. Uh, you're going to be taxed on income uh, for whatever gains you have on them. Um, that's just the premise of a trading LLC. If you're not going to make more than 20 trades a year, you know, it, it's probably advantageous to have a holding company uh, and execute it that way. And um, if you're going to continue to add to it, um, you just want to have a written consent or written action that are documented uh, because these are public ledgers and you're moving the assets from an exchange into the wallet that's held by the LLC, that can suffice for uh, the written action or written consent. And so um, the only time that you would have to amend the operating agreement or add an addendum would be if you gifted another wallet or asset to the business. So let's say you, know, you already got Bitcoin, XRP, XLM, Ethereum in your LLC, and uh, now you're going to add some XDC okay, that you bought, um, you would have to draft an addendum, you know, another capital contributions page, list the wallet there, um, the XDC as the ticker, the amount of the XDC and the, the current value of it, the date that you gifted it, and then, you know, get that notarized. Uh, and then that wallet would then be in the LLC and you could continue to add to it uh, through the manner that I mentioned before. I wonder where uh, Vendel is. Hopefully he can get on here. Um, so our first time using this, by the way. So uh, we sent him the link, and we'll see what what happens. Um, let's see here. We got a few more questions. How do I find a good attorney or CPA in the state specializing in crypto or tax modification? Um, yeah, I, that's, that's what I do. 
Digital Ascension Group. Um, I've aggregated all those people under one. Um, no, I want to say company. We we partner with them. Uh, but if it's something that you're interested in, if you need attorneys or CPAs, accountants, wealth manager, funds and foundations, estate planner, uh, all that stuff, we can refer you to the people that know what they're doing. Uh, I interviewed a little over 200 professionals across the U.S. over the last three years. And, um, you know, we've got the best of the best or what I feel is the best of the best. There's Vandell. Hey, Jake, how are you, buddy? I yeah, can yeah. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, now we're good to go. Man. Oh, okay, perfect. Anyway, how are you, Jake? Good to Doing see good, you. Doing good, brother. Yeah, I appreciate good. you hopping on here. Uh, oh, man, we've got man. a lot of people watching and listening, so excited to have you. I'm excited too, man. Um, it's been a while since we actually spoke. Last time we were together at that conference meeting, you know, in Houston yeah. here. Remember yeah, I that? gave everybody a little bit of background before you got on. Um, oh, okay. and just let them know, you know, we, we, uh, I figure it's been long enough, you know, there's been enough controversy about Jimmy's deal at this point. Um, <laughs> you can say that still, again. Yeah. You know, people are going to think what they want to think. I, I think, um, maybe we start there. You know, I, I think Jimmy wanted to figure out, you know, a realistic valuation for XRP, um, based on the use cases. And I think he was able to establish that with the white paper and, what they drafted, um, you know, kind of ruffled some feathers with some people, but uh, I think it accomplished his objective. What, what do you think? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I feel like there's a huge misconception there. A lot of people ask, why would he even take that leap? Why would he even waste that much resources and time and commit so much to getting that together for the public? And the simple fact is this, that in the past historically they confiscated gold and they had a very good reason why they did that and what did they do after they did that in 19 the executive order by president d roosevelt they reevaluated it and revalued it to a higher price than what they took it off people's hands for mm -hmm. and they didn't just come confiscate it you were forced to bring in your gold now, this has way more utility in today's world than actual gold. You know what I'm saying? So um, in at least in today's age, and that's realistically speaking, based on everything going on in the world. So once he took that approach and they came together with the fair market value and put in all this time and effort, at least there's something solid there to protect people that do own it. You yeah, know, and that, go ahead. There's a lot of technical components there for actually orchestrating something where if if a buyback did occur, people were protected, um, and you would get an actual something substantial for it, not just fiat dollars. You know, I think that was another misconception by people was that you know you would get USD or or some other fiat currency that could just be inflated into oblivion. Uh, he specified in the documents that they would be you know SDRs or gold would have to be the uh, traded component there for it. Um, and it was going to be done through an algorithmic, uh, trust where there was a smart contract that would be executed and payment would be made. So it's not like things can be taken from you or the transaction could be obscured. Um, he went to great length to make sure that, you know, if that does ever occur, we have an actual plan in place to be able to make sure people are protected, which I thought yeah. was great. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you 100% because uh, especially the way the government operates, I mean, the IRS is a perfect example. They can literally just come and confiscate your assets and your funds. So those lengthy measures put in place and that contingency plan is, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's overlooked and it's extremely important because who knows, maybe nothing will happen, but if it ever does, like you said, Jake, that is in place there and there's that solid protection for owners of that particular asset. Well, and the other component for that for XRP in particular is that that asset cannot be frozen or taken um, on the network, right? So uh, if you lose your keys in a boating accident <laughs> somehow, <laughs> uh, it'd be real hard for them to take it from you. Um, but I, and they can't freeze accounts. They can list you 
on uh, you know a terrorist list like OFAC. List. Yeah, um, so that's a problem. But aside from that, they really ask any issued asset on the XRPL. They can freeze and call back and do all that. And especially after the callback is issued, um, they'll be able to facilitate that. But XRP, the the native asset, that won't ever be a possibility. Which I you know I like. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. I do. Well, what, uh, what all do you want to get into? I, you know, I kind of hyped you up before we got on here and told everybody that we would get into, um, you know, maybe some UBI, gold and silver, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, let's, CBDCs and uh, mm -hmm. the controversy there. Where, where do you want to start? Yeah, so um, actually, I'm passionate about all those topics right there and very invested in them with my time. Um, but we could start with the central bank digital currencies because, uh, I mean, there it's there's data to back this up. And pretty much every nation in the world is already in developing a central bank digital currency. They're in the process of it or they already have one. So we can start there. Um, but, yeah, it's not just some fantasy. It's actually coming to fruition. So. Yeah, they're, they're either developing, um, Japan has moved to um, the pilot phase of theirs, I believe. They're the mm -hmm. first G7 nation to make that move. Um, so it's kind of my anticipation that they're likely to be the first to go live with the CBDC, uh, which could have significant implications for the U.S. because they are the U.S. Uh, largest treasury holder abroad, aside from ourselves. Yeah. And... Um, you know, if they were to start dumping those in, in short order, um, what do you, what do you think about this? What do you think about tether being the Ponzi scheme that the feds using to absorb the treasuries that are being dumped? Yeah, I believe that. Uh, so my brother, Versan Al Jara, he, uh, he has dug very deep into this following the money and there's so many trails. I think you froze. There's so many trails that lead to that connection right there what you were just stating so <clears throat> we like to follow the money as much as we can because really we believe if you follow the money it's like putting pieces of a puzzle together and then at least you get a clear picture you know what i'm saying so and a lot of that information not all of it but most of it is out there you just need to know where to look and then have a good sense of judgment yeah. and logic to connect the dots and uh, Tether is, in fact, 100% a Ponzi scheme. Um, yeah, there's plenty of evidence to support this. I mean, uh, yeah, it's just insane. But wh what do you think about that? Yeah, I, you know, um, we'll see how things play out. But it's interesting to me that they've now launched these Bitcoin ETFs, right? And, and it mm -hmm. could have, I, I think previous, if Tether had imploded, they may have been able to silo that to crypto markets. But now there would be exposure to traditional markets if we did see some, well, you know, if they if they issue stablecoin regulation that comes from Congress mm -hmm. and then they were to go audit that firm and their books, um, might be interesting what they find, right? Might be yeah. out of line. And then, you know, we, we could see some, some market problems yeah. <laughs> if the liquidity in that asset in particular were to come under question. Um, I mean, we saw what happened with Terra Luna when when that imploded on itself and the implications for the broader market. Um, and and I think, you know, it's interesting to me that that when Tether is printed, uh, Bitcoin tends to increase in value. Yeah, of course. I, 100%. That's actually one of the things I wanted to bring up. Hey, that's one. That's just one. OK, but that's a big one, too. That's easily uh, noticeable if you really look at the charts. And even layer them on top of each other, which anybody could do with a computer and the right, you know, software. Um, yeah, every time it's created out of thin air, really, it's backed by nothing. It's kind of like the U.S. dollar, um, just a digital version. Yeah, Bitcoin pumps to the freaking moon, and of course, that's when the media is telling you there's something here, because then they use you as exit liquidity. And this is what was happening before the Bitcoin ETF. I'm not tooting my horn or anything, but I was telling people I'm expecting a market correction and exactly it happened. It, it went to 46,000 or something like that. And right after that, uh, you know, this is how the game is, man. I mean, it's the truth. You know, I've seen it. Uh, 
I've seen it all the time. And um, yeah, they they use the media as leverage. Hmm. And it has they have their own agendas, you know, and one of them is for the financial system. OK, um, they pump the markets. They know the little guy watching is going to follow Jim Cramer and hop on that. OK, so and they exit. It's exit liquidity. They use the little guy so they can get out. And then that's where you see that correction in there. And then there's all kinds of internal, you know, wash trading and corruption. Um, Bitcoin has something to do with that as well. It's very interesting. But that's a whole other topic that we dug into. What What do you think about this um, gentleman that's supposedly from the CIA that has Satoshi in his name? His uh, identification card's been put out and they're basically, you know, stating that this is Satoshi uh, from 2009, you know, for the first transaction and the, the hash they've decoded to read, you know, this is this person sending Bitcoin to this person. Um, do you think that's the real Satoshi or do you think that's kind of a scapegoat and, you know, what are, what are the implications of that? Yeah, well, I think it's, um, I think it's all manipulation, to be honest with you. Um, but what do you think? What do you think? You know, I, um, I think Bitcoin has accomplished a lot of different narratives for governments and institutions um, that, that have been beneficial for them. So if you needed a marketing ploy uh, to get things out to the public, make them aware of digital currency, make them accepting of digital currency uh, and the narrative for that, I think yeah. it's accomplished that. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see what the long term use for the mining pools is because I don't think that the network will persist uh, till the last Bitcoin is mined, but I think they built that infrastructure out and incentivized that for some other reason. I don't know what that will be, but I'm interested to see there. And then, um, you know, if you needed, you know, again, to manipulate markets and cause a problem to implement a solution, I think we're at a point now where that could actually be a possibility now that we have the ETFs and they are attached to the, the traditional financial markets. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, uh, my thinking, honestly, Jake, is very much in alignment with yours. Um, since the 1930s, they've been doing the problem, reaction, solution. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. The data is out there. You know, um, so I'm looking at everything objectively. I'm not a XRP maxi. I'm not a Bitcoin hater or on other any other lane. It's just I look at it from the scope of if I had none of it, you know, kind of objectively, as I'm trying to say. So I do agree with you there. But um, for Bitcoin, uh, this is the truth. I mean, I'm not saying it's a, it's easy to do, but um, if they shut off on and off ramps, or destroy the mining pools. I mean, that's it. Yeah. It's gone. They can wipe it out instantly. And now you have the cyber attack narrative. So who knows? Maybe it aligns perfectly with the financial markets. Every four years, bull run. Debt gets refinanced. Market crashes. So they might crash it after 2026. And it would be perfectly in alignment with a lot of other narratives. I'm just speculating here, but... I mean, these are what they're pushing out to the public. So any one of them can happen. And yeah, uh, not, yeah go ahead. What, what do you think on the timing of a downturn? You know, we have a lot of people um, screaming that'll be soon, uh, but we've got an election year. You know, they, they try to make sure that markets are looking good. People have money. Maybe they mm -hmm. lower the interest rate. The, pet, the Fed will pivot a little bit uh, and we could see things move a lot higher. Um, that's not good for inflation if they do that. So they're kind of backed into a corner here. What, what do you think? Do you think it's sooner or later on the correction? Yeah. So I'll answer that question. Um, but for the longest time, I've been studying financial markets and market cycles. And what I noticed is, and I'm not the only one who speaks about this. There's other people out there that, that speak about this too, but I'll bring it up. So historically since 2009, all governments reset the interest rate to near zero rates. This was right after the 2008 housing crisis. They did that in 2009, globally. And ever since 2009, 
we've been on this four year cycle. So from 2009 going into 2013 and 14, that's when Bitcoin had its its somewhat bull run. OK, mm -hmm. there was a little run there appreciation. That's when the debt gets refinanced every three to five years. And if you average out, it's every four years. So that's the same time frame as the Bitcoin having and the bull run. It's every four years. And then from then, from 14 to 2017 and 18, another bull run. That's around the time the debt gets refinanced in the system. Okay. And they print and inject liquidity into the system. That makes its way into the stock markets, the crypto markets. And then you have a Bitcoin bull run. But you had a Bitcoin halving too, again. Okay. Uh, and then again, it happens in 2020. Debt gets refinanced in the system. Around the same time as the Bitcoin halving, where the rewards are split, and then money gets injected into the system because the stimulus for 2020 and 2021, that made it way into the stock market and the crypto market. Then we had a bull run. So the debt refinance cycle every four years is the same and coincides perfectly with the Bitcoin having and the election year every four years. And now we're going into the election year. We've got the elections coming up. We've got the Bitcoin having starting on April 20 something. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, the interest rates are hitting their kind of peak now where it's really killing businesses and households. Yeah. So the Fed most likely is going to lower the interest rates so that they could refinance the debt because every four years they do it. That's around the same time as the Bitcoin having coincidentally. And they're going to give out, you know, sugar and print money into the system to make the markets look good for the election. So I'm anticipating we're going to have a huge bull run starting in probably the second, third quarter, 2024, going all the way into 2025. And then probably mid or end 2025, we're going to have a huge correction, huge. And that coincides with everything. So you talked about the four year cycles. Um, have you had Radalio on? Could you get Radalio on your Radalio on your show? Because if you could, oh, that would be man. epic, dude. Actually, um, uh, Jimmy has, uh, I think, a connection with Ray Dalio. Oh uh, wow! We talked about it at dinner one time, so uh, yeah. <laughs> we got to speak to him. Um, I don't personally, but we'll see. That would be really cool. That'd be epic, dude. But anyway, he he wrote the the book on the market cycles. He's looked at the last yeah. five hundred years and and you know the last uh, five global currencies. Um, obviously, the dollar kind of sits in that position now. Uh, kind of, I say, because we're on shaky ground. Um, but, it, I mean, you talked about four-year cycles. There's other cycles that coincide with that. So what would you say would be the the other cycle? So maybe there's the broader 80 to 100-year cycle when... Yeah, when um, empires collapse, currencies. basically. <laughs> yeah. And then there might be, you know, quarters in there and then four-year cycles inside of that. Do you think that there's, you know, maybe like a 20-year cycle? that we're kind of coinciding with on this next four year cycle here. Uh, sorry, Jake. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, there are definitely many cycles and I think they all coincide together. I don't think it's coincidence. I think they all align perfectly together. And every time the cycle comes to its, its beginning or its end is the perfect opportunity for these transitions and shifts to take place by the fed and by the governments. So it's also not a coincidence that when we had the market correction in 2020 and 2021, that market was due for a correction already. The whole pandemic thing was the perfect excuse to justify the crash. But the, the market was going to crash regardless yeah. because it was overdue. And what they had to do is they had to crash that market and the perfect way to cover that up is uh yeah the, this big thing well, this virus, yeah yeah is happening you know so but yes to answer your question there are many different cycles and we could focus on any one of them you know but yes um another thing i like to point out is and you made a good point ray dalio talks about this in his book but every 80 to 100 years you know there is a complete uh reset okay yeah. 
as the World Economic Forum, uh, Klaus Schwab coined the term, the Great Reset. But uh, this one's uh, different. But there are resets that take place. And Ray Dalio talks about this in his book every 70 or 80 to 100 years. And for them to do that, they have to break down everything, the infrastructure, to rebuild it. And this happened with Roman empires. And it's interesting because we are like the Babylon right now that you read about in history. And I think that was a reference to the future foreshadowing the United States. Um, it's really, who knows, but we're like the Babylon right now and we're going through a complete economic restructure and reset on all levels from the basic foundation of you know employees and households all the way to the supply chain and the financial system and even beyond how governments operate you know now they want more control you know it's always been about control but they don't just roll it out overnight and say hey guys this is the new plan you know they have to get people to adapt very slowly <clears throat> they want buy-in right yeah and, and so they, they train you over a period of time to be accepting of whatever it was. So we got the stimulus in 2020. And so I'll kind of segue that into the UBI, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Uh, 100%, Jake. And yeah. before you continue, that was like the first test, really, for them to know that, hey, people are cool with sitting at home and they could receive a check. So we could really take this to the next level, basically. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I... <laughs> I probably have a bit different perspective on this and, and I'd like to get yours on it. Um, sure. And I may be a little bit more dystopian than you. Uh, well, I say that maybe, maybe a little more optimistic than, than, than you guys have been on it. I don't know. Okay. We'll see. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of different dynamics at play here. You, you've got the inflation from the M2 money supply, you know, coming it's the highest it's ever been. Um, and you've got two components of inflation. You've got velocity of money across an economy, uh, along with the amount of money that exists. We're currently at the yep. lowest velocity that's that's ever been. Uh, and the Fed can't manipulate that. They can a little bit with interest rates, but they don't have direct control over the velocity of money. But if you had a CBDC, you would be able to put time limits. Absolutely. On Which how, means you have control of it. Correct. So it's another lever they can pull. My and this is kind of where I'm going to go in a different direction than most people are going to talk to. Okay. Um, so we've got a convergence of all of these significantly deflationary technologies. You've got AI, you've got blockchain smart contracts, you've got 3D printing. I think that over the next decade, production and cost to produce things will drop substantially with the implementation of these technologies. So... Mm -hmm. If I was governments and I knew that was on the horizon, I might front run that with some inflation um, and then bring in UBI on top of that to be able to print money in opposition to the deflationary effect of those technologies um, and actually hold price stability. So if you were able to aggregate all the data for the transactions across an economy, um, the reason that the Soviet Union failed was because they couldn't allocate resources appropriately. There were discrepancies yeah. in the economy um, that fixed themselves in a free market. People will find an arbitrage. They will, they will work that and make the money off of it. And then that gap closes, right? Yeah. Uh, but if you had an AI, they could analyze all of those transactions across an economy. It could then incentivize and disincentivize spending across the economy to fill those gaps. And if you had, again, the deflationary effect of all of these things being implemented, you could potentially print money in opposition to that if you understood all of the factors at play and hold price stability of goods while allowing for UBI. What, what do you think? 100% uh, agree with you. And I'm not just saying that, I do, absolutely. I mean, that's the plan because they know what's coming. All right. The, th the fact is they want us to think they don't know and they're clueless, but they know. All right. They planned out for the next 20. They're for God's sake, they're planned out for the next 50 years. They know in several years from now, a lot of people are not going to have jobs because AI is taking over. 
I was just on the phone with a credit union um, lady the other day. And you know what she told me? She said, oh, you can leave me a voicemail when you call back. Actually, she said, don't. Um, we, we don't have that. Never mind. I, I just remembered AI. They did an artificial intelligence thing. It's um, We don't have an extension now. So just call the branch back. <laughs> that's what she told me. So, um, and that's here in Texas. Okay. Hmm. So, but yes, uh, AI is completely disrupting the economy. Um, it has its pros and cons, but the government and the people running the show, pulling the strings, the feds, they all know this. Nations know this, you know, and they're anticipating it. And they're, it's like a chess game. They're preparing their moves ahead of time. Um, and on your point, you, you're, you make a very valid point um, with the Soviet Union, too. So, um, yeah, I, I hadn't heard anybody else articulate it that way. I've, I've put that together because I watch, you know, I, I, I really applaud you guys. You guys have had some really impactful people on your Thanks, brother. podcast. And um, a lot of the people, you know, Andy and, and Peter, um, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki. Um, who, who's the Bond King? Um, Steve. Oh, you should get him on. Um, I'll have to get you his information. Oh, I'd um, love to. Yeah. Who, but he, who he talks talking? about uh, the Bond King is what he goes by, but he has a YouTube okay. channel also. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, I, I watch about 40 different people that have expertise in different components of the macroeconomic you know, environment. Yeah. Environment. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. there's only been one person that I've seen that talked about, and he's the other way on the deflation. He doesn't understand the implementation of uh, UBI in order to counteract it. He thinks that we're going to have this huge deflationary crash with the Im implementation of all these technologies. Because he's missing um, the other part of the, the education and knowledge for the AI yeah. and the what's happening that, in the world the digital really. currency right yeah, yeah. He, and, and i think a lot of people are missing that boat you know um they just it's it's weird to be in a position where i i have the knowledge base to like put that together and and I, all of these people i watch i regard and such a high you know have a high regard for i regard uh, mm -hmm. like um who oh uh george gammon i think he's brilliant yeah i know him he's yeah he's He's a smart guy, but I feel like uh, there's some things he's missing too. Yeah, and that's the other deal. I'm <laughs> like, you're so brilliant, and yet, how like, are you not seeing this and including yeah. it in your equation? Yeah, I know. Um, but you only have the people around you that you you know bring into your circle, you know, and and you pay attention to what you're going to pay attention to. So, um, and I could be completely wrong. You know, I'm speculating. Uh, we could be way off base. I don't think we are. I don't think we are. No, because <laughs> the truth is. Uh, uh, again, not to toot our own horns, but a lot of these guys, they're extremely intelligent and bright and way more skilled than I am, okay? But they are focused on just one very narrow scope, and that's the problem. The problem is everything is connected. So if you're not up to speed and up to date with central bank digital currencies, XRP, the new financial system, the traditional financial system and how money actually flows and markets work then and also artificial intelligence and robotics then you're missing a huge component of where the future is going and your evaluation is inaccurate because you're missing a piece of the puzzle it's uh it's steve van meter is his name he's, he's known as the bond king um, oh okay yeah I, th I think he'd be really interesting to have on with you guys if you can you can get him yeah, um, definitely. Um, uh, we're always trying to get, you know, brilliant minds on yeah. to get their insight. Um, well, let's let's pivot a little then, bit and go yeah. to um, gold and silver. And I'm going to I'm going to poke the bear on this one and kind of come at you with some arguments against the revaluation and um I think there will be one, just so you know. But I'm going to play devil's advocate, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the Fed on the on the Fed's balance sheet, gold yeah. is currently forty two dollars and some odd cents. Um, so what's to say they don't just revalue it to the, the current price of gold that trades with the paper? Well, first of all, the gold price is one hundred percent manipulated. 
Um, I'm not the only one who talks about this. Jim Rickards, yeah. this guy is a big deal, okay? And many others. Uh, the reason they talk about it is because there's evidence to support it. They're not pulling it out of their butt. These are intelligent people with data, figures, and numbers, and everything they're saying is supported by that. So, in conclusion, there will be a reevaluation because the current spot price we see is manipulated. It's lower than what it actually should be, and it's fair, true fair market value. Now, how is it manipulated? Through paper contracts. Yeah. That's it. I mean, if you can add more supply of something because it's all digital, that's it. You just uh, you manipulated it. <laughs> well, what about Basel III? When, when does that uh, go into effect and they have to actually audit the, the backing for the paper? So I don't have the date at the top of my head. Um, I know it's coming very soon. And uh, that ties into the new financial system as well. There's a reason why central banks around the world are accumulating rec record highs of gold. It's not random. It's not because they want to build, you know, a new toilet <laughs> or something. Yeah. There's a reason for it. It's because we're going, there's a very high likelihood, a likely chance that we are going to a system that will be commodity backed and gold backed. And that's... Uh, there's a, it's a fact that we're going to a more digitized financial system with tokenization, something you and Jimmy Valley talk a lot about. That's a fact. It's coming 100%. Then why are banks accumulating so much gold if we're going to a gold-backed system, commodity-based? It's because the digital assets and gold and commodities are going to, uh, they're going to work together, Okay. And um, I don't follow, you know, go down the rabbit hole too much. Sometimes I do because it often leads to the truth that a lot of conspiracy theorists say it's a conspiracy and then it ends up being the truth. And we're right again, as usual. What's, what's, um, what's the difference between uh, a conspiracy theorist and the truth? Well, a conspiracy theorist is a critical thinker and a truth. What they tell you is the lie normally. So this is my <laughs> so, joke. My my joke is uh, the answer is six months. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, going into next year, it seems like everything's getting shorter. So it might be four months. But yeah, yeah. you're right. Six. That's so funny. <laughs> so um, did y'all have Andy? Did y'all have Andy Sheckman on? Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah. Actually, he's okay. been on uh, quite a few times. Oh, actually, brilliant guy. So he's yeah. he's a big proponent of silver. Yeah. He loves gold and silver, but he does talk a lot about silver. Yes. So, again, I'm 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 going to play devil's advocate on silver. Okay. Um, I I do think that, again that there's probably some significant upside there, um, yeah. especially in today's currency. I don't I don't know what the the exchange rate's going to be when it is revalued, um, but so we've got all of these electronics and things that. You know, large enterprise solutions and providers are dependent on silver for, and I think it's in their interest to align themselves with J.P. Morgan and all of the spoofing that goes on oh, on a regular yeah. basis to keep prices of silver low so that they can continue to operate business at high margins. Um, do you think that there will be a alternative that's introduced that replaces silver in those applications? Or do you think there really will be a revaluation and the cost of goods that we use, like our phone and other electronics, will be substantially more expensive? Well, I think uh, silver is going to continue to have even more value in the real world, in the real economy over time. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, JP Morgan is 100% manipulating precious metals markets. Of, they've actually received a fine. Um, multiple. in yeah. yeah, multiple fines. So, um, they got busted, but silver is uh, significantly undervalued. It has uh, more use cases than gold in the economy. Okay, but silver is even more suppressed than gold. I would agree. So, it, well, it's the only asset that's still under its all-time high from the 1980s. That's a very good point you made. Yeah, 100%. And on top of that, when they do 
come up to their true market value or get revalued by the central banks over a weekend or something. Um, kind of like how they did with gold yeah. in the 1930s. Yeah, well, silver will shoot up in a higher, for anybody watching, it would go up much higher in percentage points. Than yeah, gold. and that's kind of where I want to like, I don't want to say come in opposition. I'm hesitant to believe that. Um, and I hope I'm wrong. I hope I, I own silver, just to be clear with everybody. I do think it's so. This this is how I position myself with precious precious metals. Uh, I have my emergency fund in precious metals. So like six months worth of expenses in gold and silver. Um, I Smart. I I think that if silver was going to be revalued at that scale. Uh, that more central banks would be accumulating that versus gold. Um, you make a you, good what point. Do you, what do you say to that? Like, well, my main focus, uh, my main focus is, <clears throat> well, you make a very good point, and I've always thought that gold is more important to central banks and the new financial system more than silver. And I'm not talking about the economy and in hospitals and infrastructure and I'm talking about for the financial system for money. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they're accumulating gold. Well, yeah. You, so you can pack more value into gold than you can into one ounce of silver. The, so, the BIS in 2019 uh, changed gold to a tier one asset, right? Which is zero risk. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And prior to that, it had been a tier three asset for the last 50 years, which makes zero sense. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. the only tier one asset was U.S. Treasuries. Yes. Um, seems pretty manipulated to me. But hey, <laughs> I know. Um, what, what do you think about um, a digital asset becoming a tier one asset? Yeah, I think it's going to happen in the future. Yeah, 100%. Um, it's, it's inevitable because we're moving towards a new financial system and it's going digital digital assets, cryptocurrencies, chosen ones will have their place in the new financial system. They're going to have to be classified. And the BIS, the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, they're all going to have to get involved. And there will have to be a tier for it, a classification. And where does it fit in this system? It will have to be placed somewhere. Well, they, and they allowed... Um, what was the regulation they said that, that you could hold up to 2% of your reserves in crypto for banks now, something like that? Yeah. Yeah. It was something like that. I don't remember the exact figure, but it was very low. Mm -hmm. It could have, you could be right. Yeah. 2%, 3%. It was one or two is what I thought. Okay. Um, probably 2%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I kind of anticipate, <clears throat> you know, similar to yourself. Uh, we moved to, uh, Judy Sheldon puts it very eloquently, a, uh, yes. A, a gold standard in a cryptocurrency type of way. Yes. Um, I just On had Bretton, Bretton Woods three, uh, not too long ago. Um, for those that don't know what Bretton Woods was, that was a conference in 1944 where the, uh, the U S dollar became the global reserve currency. Um, and John Maynard Keynes, you know, explained, uh, Triffin's dilemma and proposed the bank or system. Um, and obviously that wasn't adopted. We had the most gold after the war. And so we said, pack sand, we're taking it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, Nixon, you know, basically defaulted on that on August 15th, 1971, when he removed the gold window, uh, when he temporarily closed the gold, the gold window and, um, never reopened it. Obviously we were printing too much money funding Vietnam and people were exchanging their dollars for gold. And, um, yeah, since, you know, then they went over to the middle East and, uh, said, we will back you with the full force of the U S military. If you only sell oil in uh, dollars, the petrodollar. Yeah. Petrodollar. And, um, now we've, we've seen that pretty much be removed as well. We've got, uh, middle East selling oil in, um, other currencies aside from the U S dollar. So, uh, what, what do you think the time frame is before 
we see the BRICS nations, you know, implement this gold backed currency that they're talking about. And we have an actual removal of uh, the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency. Yeah, it's very difficult to give time frames, but if I if I had to guess, I'd say in a few years, maybe it could be sooner, um, because we're really getting to that uh, critical point where everything is hitting rock bottom. Like everything, they need to reset the system. Um, it's not something I'm pushing for, but based on everything going on in the world it's at that tipping point yeah i mean you got the wars escalating the currency devaluing you know to to nothing really and you know debt through the roof delinquencies um the world is falling apart and i am an optimist okay but i'm looking at the, the facts okay and i'm i'm a realist too and i'm not going to sugarcoat things and pretend it's all dandy and good and there's some you know somebody that's going to save us you know not now anytime soon at least yeah um i'm well, realistic mm -hmm. i'm with you i think you have to save yourself right you have to save yourself yeah and um just quick story um there's this story okay where this man is stuck on the island okay and then he passes away he was always trying to get off the island okay but here's the thing god the universe whatever sent him a boat one day all right he didn't want to get on the boat then one day in his life a family came to him and they said they knew a place where boats come every week okay and he didn't want to listen to them he thought they were lying and then the third sign he had in his life was all the water start to dry up for one day and he could have walked off the island and to get off but he didn't and then when he died and he went up to God. He said to God, why didn't you ever get me off that island? That's all I ever prayed for. And God said to him, I sent you that family. I sent you that boat. I dried up the water for you. I gave you all the signs and opportunity. So I did do something. But what did you do? So yes, you have to save yourself. The opportunity is there. You will. It's there, okay? You have to save yourself and take action. Um, that's the moral of the story. It's a good story. I've never heard that one before, but it, it, it resonates, especially, you know, in the time that we're in, um, you have a lot of opportunities. If, if you're willing to make some sacrifices in the short term, you know, um, I don't think you're, we're at a moment in history that won't exist again for at least another hundred years. Like we yes. talked about, yeah, right? 100%. And unfortunately, we're still playing zero sum games. In, in this reality. I'm hopeful that we move to um, a different paradigm where, where people can have aligned interest and everybody can win. And there's mutually beneficial outcomes on the other side of this for people that are participating in markets and business and other things. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I try to orchestrate my life. But we're still in a, a period where there's zero sum games and there's gonna be winners and losers. Uh, and if you, if you are uh, in a position where you're wrong footed you're listening to the wrong people, uh, you make the wrong choices. Um, there could be significant consequences. You know, my, uh, my dad was in the market in 08 and, um, you know, he had a substantial portion of his wealth tied up in the S and P obviously that collapsed, you know, with the, with the housing market and everything that happened. Uh, he was devastated. Um, oh, he was a consultant at the time and was still able to work and still able to make okay money, which was good. Um, but he uh, he had an opportunity and he would have retired much sooner if he had taken this, but he, he didn't do it. Um, <clears throat> I watched him have, um, he had about 100,000 left in his portfolio at the bottom. And um, he had uh, a buy order for American Airlines up at like right under a dollar. And he was going to go all in. And he was like, I can't do it because I think they, they, there's a chance that they'll go bankrupt, right? Uh, but yeah. then they got bailed out and then the stock went back to like 55 or $60. Oh. So had he taken that chance, even even if he had just put 10,000 in. Um, Life he, changing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think there's things right now that, you know, we've discussed some of them here that are significantly down from their all-time high. Mm -hmm. Um that 
people are scared about. Uh, they're hesitant to believe in because either it's taken too long or they're unsure for whatever reason. But those are the opportunities if you can, I'm not saying put your life savings in it, right? Like, like I said, if my dad had just taken the opportunity, and even if he had put five grand in it, you know, he could have retired and, and been done before he passed away. Yeah. Um, so for people out there that are listening, you know, nothing here is financial advice. I always speak with your financial advisor um, for, before making any financial decisions it's for entertainment and educational purposes only. But um, yeah, I think there's some opportunities that exist right now, discrepancies in the market that would be life changing for people if they take action. Absolutely. Yeah, Jake, you're 100 percent correct. And just even the thing is, when you're early, which we are early, even a little bit can make a big impact in your life because you're early. Yeah. And that's the key. You always want to be in early. So yeah, there well, is that's, a, mm -hmm. that's why people make so much money in private equity. Right. Uh, but there's a lot more risk yeah. there, too. And that, that's no risk, no reward. Um, you know, we work with people in the mastermind group and we do we run private deals there. Uh, we get allocations of of private equity. Um, we have we're not running this one yet, so I can talk about it. I, I talked to my broker the other day. We might have <laughs> SpaceX, um, which would be okay. cool. Um, really, it's a real allocation of SpaceX. It's not okay. the scams that are out there. Because watch out for that. There's a lot of scams. Um, I'm always hesitant to believe people, but this came from a very reliable source. Incredible. And they 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 custody private equity, so I don't think they would lie to me um oh wow anyway so um yeah that's amazing i mean see opportunities like this they when they come you know i mean sometimes you just got to take them because i mean that's the thing so, there's so many opportunities out there but great opportunities are very rare you you get like three fat pitches in, in your lifetime. That's what I call them. And, and you, you know, you pointed those out about the man on the Island. Um, I think you get three really big opportunities if you're lucky in your life and it doesn't take, but one of them, right. If you can just capitalize on one of those fat pitches and hit that ball um, and take a swing, then it'll set you up. And then, you know, we help with people on the other side of that, make sure that they manage their wealth and don't lose it. Uh, you should only have to get rich once. But yeah, um, <laughs> there's some people that, you know, hit all three fat pitches and <laughs> still end up broke. But yeah, like, um, uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, athletes because they yes. don't know how to manage and maintain their money. <clears throat> Getting wealth is level one. But after you get the wealth, the level two is maintaining it. And then level yeah. three is growing it. So, yeah, War um, but yeah, that's Warren Buffett's number one rule is don't lose money. And uh, the second rule is refer to rule number one. Don't forget. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. You know, that's so intelligent, but very clever, too, because he's right. Um, um, there was something I did want to bring up. Yeah. So it's real quick on gold and then we could hop back yeah, on the conversation. So, you know how we were talking about gold being revalued. Mm -hmm. So there is proof. The gold reevaluate. OK, so every central bank, including the Federal Reserve, has their gold account on the central on their on their balance sheet mm -hmm. under the gold revaluation account is what it's listed under and this is information yes <clears throat> and this is information that's public so people can go find this themselves from the central banks it's public information it's under the revaluation account that's where they're dedic dedicating their gold holdings on their balance sheet. So it's not um, just called a gold revaluation account for no reason. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. That they yes, would... you can verify that. Yeah. Hmm. It's uh, verifiable information. Can, and, do you have a um, link or something you can, sh you can share in the chat? Uh, <laughs> I can, I can find it. Um, I don't have it on me right now, but I can find it. And okay. uh, mark my word, it's it's uh, it's it's from their their balance sheet. So, 
I mean, I believe you. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say it, that if it wasn't you, there. You can do some some tricky things with your balance sheet. So I'll I'll speak about one um, that we help people with. Um, okay. So you can you can actually write off your investment in digital assets uh, against your taxes as uh, an investment in software or R and D. Uh, if your business is going to utilize that asset in the future for something that's integral to your business, right? So yeah, let's yeah. say you have a payment business, uh, maybe you're a credit card processor or something of the sort. Um, it's completely legal for you to purchase, you know, assets that might be utilized for that service in the future um, and, and write those off. Uh, now you're depreciating those assets and writing them down. So if you do take profits later, there are tax implications associated with that. But, you know, um, it's interesting that things are that way. Uh, yeah, so no, uh, that is interesting. Um, there was one other person that had asked way earlier uh, in the evening that I wanted to address. And they had asked me um, how much, you know, AUM or assets under management before we work with them as a family office. Uh, the threshold for us to start working with the clients around 20 million in assets. Um, you know, we, we will help you formalize your family office and then start orchestrating your team uh, around managing your wealth in your estate. Um, less than that, we're happy to just provide professionals ad hoc as needed uh, until people reach that level. So happy to just be a, a resource provider in the short term here if, if people are under that. Yeah, I uh, think that's. I love what you guys are doing, by the way, Jake. I think it's super it, cool. Yeah, um, it's a lot of work, but I think you're you're helping a lot of people, man. <laughs> that is Trying to good. Yeah, because the world is changing, and we need more people like yourself that are that have integrity, that are truthful, honest, and actually know where the system is going, how things are changing, and what to do about it. Um, we just can't have enough people like that. To be honest, I appreciate that, man. We um, we're doing our best. Just put helpful information out and provide resources. Like I said, um, oh, I just uh, want to say uh, thanks to Clarence for the super chat. By the way, uh, he's asked. Uh, so excited to finally catch you live. Um, would love to have you uh, for a consult. Yeah, appreciate you being here, and and we're happy to uh, provide value for you guys there in the chat. If, um, how much longer can you hang out, Mandel? Yeah, we could keep going for 10 more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got uh, some time. You um, want to go ahead and, and open it up for questions for people? Yeah, sure. Um, and I just wanted to mention, uh, one more thing. Yeah, please. Um, before we do the questions. So, um, just yesterday, we, Versan and I, on the Black Swan Capitalist YouTube channel, we had a guest on. Um, excuse me. Actually, we had him on this morning. It's been a long day. Um, his name is Gordon Andrew. Okay. He runs a law firm in Chicago. It's called Gordon Law. So we had Andrew on. He's a crypto tax lawyer and a CPA. Beautiful. And this is the first time we had a lawyer CPA on that specializes in crypto. And we asked him a very good question. We're going to post the video on our channel uh, tomorrow, by the way, and on my personal channel. I just started. Um, but we asked him this. We we said, okay, is 2024 and 2025 going to be a big audit year? And he would know. He's been in the game since 2014 doing crypto and taxes for people with his firm. He said in 2017, they had record high um, uh, audits. Uh, yeah, audits and clients coming into them, you know, in the hundreds of thousands, millions. Uh, from the bull run and then he said around 2021 20, 2020 same thing and then he said the this is his words i quote uh 2024 and 2025 will be even bigger because they're the irs is getting even more agents for preparing for this that's what he said and then he said because this will be even bigger the bull run because the stars are aligning perfectly so he's anticipating that 
every four years the bull cycles create more um upside uh, yes more uh, uh millionaires in the crypto space and uh give people more substantial gains than the previous so we're going to see more of that in the space going into 2024 and 2025 but you got to be in yeah and hold well, hold if, if you guys haven't subscribed if you're on the chat here um there's vandell's username for for his youtube channel aside from uh black swan capitalist i'm sure he would he would love to have you over there with him as well um blessed Thanks, to have sure. him on here with me um let's do the questions huh yeah kind of run through some some of these here let's see here um do you believe the price of XRP is suppressed? No matter what groundbreaking news comes out, uh, it, would, it would even move a needle. Well, uh, can I go first on this one? Go ahead, Jake. I want yeah, I want to hear what you have to say. So absolutely, um, it, it is it is held down, um, and there's a couple reasons for that, and and they're in alignment with the long term benefit. Okay, I know it's frustrating here in the short term. Um, Ripple actually does dump onto the market. Mm -hmm. um, they, they unlock a billion dollar or a billion XRP every month. Uh, they take whatever allocation they need and re escrow the rest. Um, and they put that onto the market to hold price stability. And that's their mandate. You know, they, they use it as a payment mechanism to settle payments. It needs to be fairly stable. If it has large fluctuations in value, there's going to be discrepancies in the payments they're settling. Yeah. So if, let's say you had, you know, $100 and you want to send that to Mexico and it lands over there and there was a move in the three to four seconds it took, you know, if it moves just 1%, that now it's $101 that landed over there. Um, so I, I know people are disgruntled by that. Um, but when, when the time comes, and I don't know when that's going to be, I, I don't have a crystal ball any more than anybody else. Um, but I anticipate you know, for it to fulfill the use case that they would like it to. Uh, and that I anticipate it'll have to be a much higher stable price than what it is today. So, yes. um, you know, I, I do think it's suppressed. Um, and, and they also, there needs to be a delineation between Ripple, the company and the news that comes out for that and all the partnerships and everything and the token itself, because if those were correlated, then it would be a security of Ripple. Uh, and so they need to, you know, keep that separation. You can't have good, you know, obviously there was a pump when we got the uh, the clarification that XRP was not a security in the eyes of the courts. Uh, we still don't have full regulation from Congress uh, when they passed the stablecoin bill. I anticipate, you know, French Hill said that that's coming Q1 this year, that, uh, you know, hope, hopefully that's the case. Then we will have actual congressional clarity around XRP and then you should see, you know, implementation and adoption. What do you think, Mendel? Yeah, I agree with you. And I think they take these uh, cases very slow, uh, deliberately. I think they do that intentionally. Okay. Because they're all about buying time right now. Everything is against them. And as you said previously, they're backed into a corner. So it only makes logical sense for them to really delay the process, but they got to keep it moving. But just move as slow because uh i mean they they can if they want to go to war and invade a country they'll they can make that decision overnight and that requires a lot of money trillions of dollars resources but you know for something that's not in their best interest at the moment they're going to take it real slow but they could move quick on it if they wanted to but well, it's, uh trickle 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 flood uh <laughs> Or, or you know, moves. Uh, what was it? Um, things, things take decades to happen, and then uh, decades happen in weeks. Something like that. Yeah, that's yeah, we, that's quote, so but, true. Um, yeah, and we see that. We've got uh, a few more questions here. Um, when do you see thirty trillion coming in for Bitcoin? Uh, I think that the entire crypto market cap could be thirty trillion. I am hesitant to believe that will ever be the market cap for Bitcoin in particular. Uh, would love to be wrong. I have clients that hold significant allocations to Bitcoin. Um, but uh, yeah, I hesitant to believe that 30 trillion ever come into just Bitcoin in particular. Uh, I think it 
the, the crypto market will definitely surpass that at some point in the future. Um, when we were at Swell, you know, Brad had stated that uh, he thought within the next five to 10 years, we'd see a 10 to 100x on the crypto market cap. And it was around a trillion dollars. So uh, 10 to 100 trillion is what Brad sees over the next five to 10 years. What, what do you think, Mendel? Yeah, I could see that. Um, well, five to 10 trillion, um, I see in the next two years. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I don't see that in five to 10 years. No, we'll be probably 30 million or more, or um, all the cryptos will be wiped out and we'll have just like uh, several that we operate on. And that would be the new system. That's realistic. Um, but yeah, five to $10 trillion is my projection from 2024 into 2026. That's my projection because right now we're about uh, one something, 1 right? Three, 1.4, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look historically, <laughs> every time we have more adoption, the uh, crypto market crap, uh, market crap, <laughs> market cap, yeah market cap increases substantially but this cycle it's a little different because now we have true mainstream adoption so you can expect even more trillions to come into the market see what i mean yeah, um, yeah well if, if we do get the institutional adoption at scale um obviously you know they've hit, they had the introduction of the etfs which was kind of a nothing burger uh, yeah. but it worked for gold too you know um and people you know haven't made that correlation yet we have seen um, a pretty significant rise in the value of gold after they introduced the GLD. Uh, but it went down in the short term after they introduced it. And then, you know, over the next couple of decades is, is gone up significantly. Um, maybe that's how it plays out for Bitcoin. You know, it's yet to see. Um, there's an interesting question here um, that I'm, I'm not even aware of. So maybe you are and you could speak to this. Yeah. Um, he says, Charles, this gentleman says, Charles Ward, who talks about the QFS. Quantum uh, financial yeah. system. Yeah, it has said that um, JP Morgan might already be in Chapter 13 for its fiat business. Um, that's a that's a level of bankruptcy for people that don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you have any insight on that? Um, if I mean, they, they have a, such a huge allocation of silver. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that they're... Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, Charlie Ward, um, uh, he's an interesting character. Um, I think he's very intelligent. Um, uh, but I, I haven't seen too much of what he has to say, to be honest. Um, uh, but no, if anything, JP Morgan is going to wipe out every regional bank and they're going to be the last one standing because they were chosen all right, by the cabal. <coughs> they're backed by big money big families and um yeah they got the banking cartel mafia protecting them yeah, i mean I that's the politicians in their pocket that's what lobbying is it's just pure corruption i mean the the truth is jp morgan uh they are one of the big players and i don't think they'll be going down i don't see that happening yeah, they'll I'm, find a loophole okay i'm kind of with you I, I don't anticipate that playing out that way um I'm going to talk about some coincidences here. Um, you guys can come to your own conclusions on this. Uh, and like I'm sure some months? people, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, got a super chat here. I just want to say, uh, taking the opportunity to thank both y'all. Um, both have been pivotal in education, preparing people while we wait for the market crap. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. Appreciate <laughs> you, brother. Um, so That's very kind of him. If if you're not aware of the Titanic, uh, do you do you know this story, Vandell? The insurance scam. Well, aside from that, J.P. Like so, Morgan. <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, that was an honor. They the, have a whole the, book on it. Uh -huh. The the three wealthiest families that opposed the Federal Reserve were on were the boat. also on the Titanic uh, when it sunk. Yeah. yeah. And uh, J.P. Morgan was supposed to be on the Titanic. Him and his assistant pulled out the day before. Yeah, no coincidence. Yeah. Um, and they had the Olympic, which you're talking about for the insurance component of that, which boats have been notorious for insurance scams. Uh, but the Olympic was hit by a U.S. submarine. And the U.S. submarine, the U.S. government wouldn't claim fault. And so they wouldn't be able to, they, didn't, they weren't able to get the insurance on it. Uh, and if you look at, there's some pictures exactly of the Olympic. It next to the Titanic in the harbor 
and they're like identical. Identical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, anyway, and, and, and it just happened to be the same spot where the Olympic got hit that they hit the iceberg. Um, it was all set up. There's yeah. too many coincidences that line up to where you have to be mentally blind if you can't just see the big picture. Seriously. There's wrong in your brain i mean there's too many coincidences that that had to be planned there's no way that's not planned because the universe doesn't work like that (laughs) yeah and somebody's just posted you know the the titanic happened in 1912 and then sure enough the fed came about in 1913 and then Uh, sure enough they all died the guys that (laughs) were against it (laughs) jacob astor and the the two other families that uh, opposed the federal reserve that would have had the capability to stop it from being formed um, yeah, and then sure enough, they all got paid for the insurance. Yeah, anyway. and then sure enough, they all won. They got what they wanted at the end. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. When well, you talk about the corruption, you know. Um, yeah, good point you made. That's a yeah, fantastic story actually. But it's crazy. You got um, Monica Powell with the U.S. Treasury note as our new currency. Could that mean J.P. Morgan? be holding the silver back um, that the currency for the treasury, you know? um, So I'm sure you've been looking at the debt clock and all the pictures that have been coming on there. Mm -hmm. And um, we've got JFK uh, represented on the uh, gold back currency note that they've listed for the $10 bill on there a couple times. Okay. Um, He was the last president that tried to remove the federal reserve and in state, uh, what's listed in our constitution and reback our currency with silver. Uh, he actually had notes issued and minted um, that were going to be put out. And then obviously he was, you know, removed. Yeah. Taken uh, out. Yeah. That's how they do it. They did the same thing with Gaddafi. He mm-hmm. was working on an African gold uh, back currency to unite the nations over there. And they um, basically said, this guy is a humanitarian problem. The truth is, no, I actually lived there. I lived on that part of the world. Did you really? That was not the case. I saw the real news. So I was in Dubai, in Saudi Arabia. Okay. I was in Bahrain. That's all nonsense. It was all lies. And then when I come to the U.S. here, everything I'm seeing is 100% different on TV than what's really happening over there. And it's not like I'm just watching both media channels. I'm coming from the zone. You were there. Yeah, I was there. So, um, yeah, they... <clears throat> they did that. Mm-hmm. What do you think about the current conflict that's going on in the Middle East? Is that exacerbated on the media here or is it real? I mean, I, I don't know. And that's why I'm asking. Well, I haven't been to the Middle East in a while well, recently, um, but I can tell you that um, they're, they're, when they um, invade or step into wars overseas, okay, they are knocking out you know how you kill two birds with one stone yeah okay no they're killing like 30 birds with one stone they knock out so many agendas with one agenda okay yeah one action one action yeah so there's a lot of things playing out and the war is a perfect um scapegoat yeah scapegoat um not just cover up but it gives them the ability to uh, create more money out of thin air. Okay. Yeah. Print money. Okay. That keeps the system going. Now they can uh, do other activities that we don't hear about. Okay. Uh, Now they have more leverage in the Middle East, which they've always wanted since day one. That's why we invade every nation in the Middle East. (laughs) So, I mean, it's not just about resources. There's other reasons too. Um, but yeah, they're, they're doing a lot of nefarious activities. And when I say they, I'm talking about, um, people have different names for these entities, but it's really the people pulling the strings. Okay. That call the shots. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of corruption going on and they always want control in the middle East and pretty much throughout all over the world. Because right now, the U.S. dollar is really lo- almost losing its reserve status. We're, we're going, it's, it's literally happening right before our eyes. So there's many reasons for it. 
Do you think that uh, the third world nations will be allowed to come up and, and then the level playing field that they discuss will actually exist? You know, do you think we'll be able to lift those people up and bring them to a level that's uh, a higher standard of living when, when all of this, you know, over the next three to five years plays out? Yeah, I think um, once things are, well, things are going to get much worse before they get better. I believe that. I think we're at that stage in the cycle where we're about to go through that, or most people are. Um, but when it comes up, uh, when they come out of it, I feel like the system that they're preparing to put in place will have pros and cons. Yeah. So, yes, I oh, think people, yeah, people will be able to have a better living situation because of a financial reset and restructuring of the system to some extent. Um, this could even have a role for central bank digital currencies and then AI yeah. creating more unemployment. If people are unemployed, well, they need to survive. How do you do that? You got to give them a central bank digital currency, but it will have its cons, you know, because now you're giving up your life. Your if you don't have financial sovereignty and control of your money, you're going to be poor for the rest of your life or stuck in the same boat because you can't save, you can't grow and it's a well, I, I think cycle. that's I think that's the paradigm people already exist in and they just aren't aware of it. Um yeah. the yeah. the inflation is a tax on people and a and it's, tax. it's invisible. People don't yeah. realize that they're losing value year over year. Um I'll, I'll talk about my dad again. So he, again, big proponent, just put your money in the S&P 500, set it there, doubles every seven years, you're good, you can retire when you're old. I'm not trying to retire when I'm old, I'm trying to get there a little bit sooner so I can <laughs> enjoy it. Um, but I, what, what I came to realize is actually that just holds the value of your capital. It stays up with inflation. You never actually get ahead. Yes. Investing in traditional markets. Yes. Um, which Especially is great. when you have a financial advisor. Well, you, know, you got to commit 1%, 2%. I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, no, well, I, we, we can get on that. So, so we have an RIA that we formed underneath the family office. Okay. Um, and I despise uh, financial advisors that rate people for fees and don't make them any money. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way we've structured things for us is. Uh, over a certain allocation, they only take 50 basis points because you got to have something you got to be able to pay your people and keep your lights Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Pay the regulatory Absolutely. fees and all that. Like You have a lot of value you're providing. Well, you do, you do but you should also be making people money. Uh, if yeah. you're going to be managing their capital, there needs to be an aligned interest, right? Uh, Definitely. So structured our stuff like a hedge fund. So we, we take that small fee up front. It's all that we take. And then we don't make another dime until uh, our clients make over 8% return on the year. So that's that's the hurdle rate. The high water mark is their previous portfolio balance from the previous year, um, and we don't take another dime. And, and then we split it eighty twenty after that. Um, and I'm I'm hopeful that a lot of people uh, moved that model long term because, yeah, raking two percent fees on people's portfolio and and then being down, like, <laughs> I know you're just know. stealing from them. Yeah, um, yeah it's unethical. Yeah. And again, I understand, you know, you've got your compliance and your regulatory costs and you've got overhead and all those things. Um, and, and most traditional managers just do a 60, 40 allocation in bonds and stocks and they rebalance when, and this is the crazy part when one's doing good, they take profits and put it into the thing that's doing bad. Yeah. Like, yeah, <laughs> I know. Why would you, know, you, um, there was another point I wanted to make Jake. Too. Yeah, please. So um, I love what you guys do and what you were just saying, because um, the thing is, uh, most financial advisors out there, I'm talking about your typical financial advisors. OK, a lot of them are very young. Um, they've never lived through uh, uh, turbulent or difficult times or through a depression. And in fact, most of them are even are not even aware of uh, digital assets and the financial system shift that's taking place. So I don't think they're actually in the best position to be in this current time managing money at all, but it's in their best interest to 
continue to uh, pushing people to, you know, sell them stocks, bonds, ETFs, because that's how they make their money. And that's how their company uh, makes the money. Well, and, and I'll just say this, um, I annuities uh, and IULs, you know, and I love Coach JV. Uh, shout out to Coach JV and his team over there at Warrior Academy. Um, great people. Um, they talk about taking profits, and I believe in that. This next cycle, you know, I, oh, I think yeah. people should take profits. Uh, I, if you're concerned about moving it into fiat, again, if you're if you're beating the inflation, um, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Yes. You're able to transact and purchase what you need for your family, and and whatever your goals are. Um, but he talks about an IUL. Just be just be aware of how that's structured when when somebody sells you on that. Um, if it's a variable policy. If there's a significant downturn in the market and the insurance company loses a lot of money, they can hike your premiums. Uh, and, and if you don't pay those, um, then they will take it from your principal that they say can't go down in the policy. Um, and you're also capped on the upside. So most of them cap you at, at somewhere between 12 and 15% on the upside of the market. So if you had an IUL in 2020 and we had a 21% gain in the market, you, you were capped on the upside. So when, when you're working with somebody and setting those things up, they can be very advantageous. I like them for, for kids, especially uh, if they've got a, you know, an extended time period that that money can be in the market. Um, I do think that we'll go through, you know, continual bull markets over time. There probably will be a pretty substantial correction uh, here in the next few years. Uh, but if, if your time horizon is 20 or 30 years, you're probably going to be doing okay. You know, yeah. um, and, and that can be an effective tool in that case. Um, but the most lucrative thing somebody can do for themselves right now is roll your IRA when you're close to retirement into an IUL. Uh, and there's a significant premium that they get paid on the front end of that deal. So just be, just be leery if somebody sells you that as the end all be all best thing ever. Yeah. Um, you know, get, get educated and make sure you're working with somebody that has your best interest at heart. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You're, you're, you're correct about that. Um, you gotta be careful out there you really do um and um per personally based on my research and you probably agree jake but at the current time and this market cycle this period that we're in i truly believe and i'm confident that cryptocurrencies and digital assets are going to provide the greatest return on investment within the next few years um, starting in 2024 going into 2025 I don't think I don't think anything will pr provide um, returns as high as cryptos and digital assets. Um, but uh, again, people need to do their research. And the other thing is, you know how you were saying inflation is a hidden tax um, on top of the real taxes, which are actually theft. Um, well, so the, inf <laughs> the, <laughs> the inflation tax, interestingly. So I always tell people this and I'll reiterate it and say it again. If you had $100,000 last year in your savings account and real inflation, okay, cost of your food, your groceries, your rent, your water, really the most important, which are excluded in core inflation. From the, from the CP lie. Yeah. Yeah. CP lie. Your real things that you need to survive, they went up 30%, actually more, but that's a conservative figure. Well, your $100,000 sitting in the bank, okay, today, has now lost 30% of its buying power, probably even more, depending what you buy with that. So your 100,000 is really gonna buy you $70,000 worth of goods, okay? Yeah. And as they continue to create money out of thin air and devalue your fiat currency, making your buying power weaker, that buying power is gonna continue to go down. So that's why your, your your $100,000 is probably going to almost get you half of what it could buy you and even less because they're going to continue to print money in 2024 and 2025. And as they print money, it hurts the little guy who has money in the bank, but it actually benefits people that own assets because asset the cost of assets go up. So our assets will go up, which means we're making money. But the people that don't own assets, they're losing. Yeah, and that's what I was saying about the S&P, right? It just holds with the same level of inflation over time. Um, 
So, so the the average deflationary rate of technology over the last two decades has been seven percent a year. Okay. So, as things have have progressed and efficiencies within manufacturing and across the economy, uh, you, you've got the internet, you've got communication that moves faster. There's a lot of things that have progressed over the last twenty years that actually should have caused about 7% worth of deflation each year. Like your stuff should have gotten 7% cheaper every year. Uh, but because the Fed prints the money and their mandate is 2%, and the reason that they stayed it's 2% is because previous, you know, when they actually had it backed by gold, uh, you could mine about 2% of the gold supply per year mm -hmm. and add that, right? So that's, that's what they wanted the inflation to be. Uh, and then that would actually be backed, but... So they're, they're actually having to inflate the currency by 9% a year to maintain their 2% mandate. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you, and, and wages haven't kept up with that. That's the other piece of this that is causing such a problem for millennials right now mm -hmm. um, is that wage growth has been like, I think 10% since 2000. Uh, but the money supply has... <laughs> exploded. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. you if if you were making $100,000 in the 90s, you were you were doing good, man. Like yeah. your wife didn't have to work, you could pay for your home, you could pay for a vehicle, you had all your insurance paid, you could had some money left over to invest, you were going on vacations. Um and now I mean, it's like you're making 45 grand. Yeah. yeah. Or less. Or less. Mm -hmm. Um in comparison to then, right? Yeah. Um, I, yep. I remember going to the store with my family and we would go like every two weeks mm -hmm. and, and my dad would spend $300 on groceries and we would get two full shopping carts. Oh yeah. I remember worth of, worth of groceries like yeah. over the top stuff, hanging off the side stuff underneath. And now I go to the store and I get like five bags and it's a hundred bucks. Yeah. And depending <laughs> what you get, sometimes it's one bag. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> It's just, you get coffee. If you're getting K cups, those are 20, 20 bucks a piece for the package, you know? Um, yeah, it's crazy. It really is. Anyway, like, and that's difficult for people to understand. I, I see, uh, especially older people at the store and, um, yeah, no, no refills. That's good. Um, <laughs> no refills. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> and they live on a, fi they live on a fixed income. My mom, you know, she worked as a teacher. She has a pension fund. She gets her social security and, and her excuse to me all the time is I'm on a fixed income. Um, which she deserves all those things. She worked for a long time um, and put up with a lot of BS from kids. But um, she, if you're on a fixed income and it's not dynamic, you're, you're going to get squeezed because again, inflation is going to continue to eat away at your purchasing power. Um, what do you think yeah. happens to social security, man? What, what's your take on that? I think there's a lot of risk in that. Um, actually, we talked to Robert Kiyosaki about that. And, uh, um, well, there's a lot of risk because if the market crashes because it's extremely overvalued, a uh, liquidity crisis can happen. Um, it can really destroy social security for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, it can have a significant impact in their real life in the world. Um, and there's a lot of people on social security. So. Yes, it could have a ripple effect, and uh, yeah, it would not be good. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I like you got to so, be very. Mm -hmm, go ahead. Yeah, if you're betting on Social Security, um, I wouldn't make that bet, even if you're close. Not now, not this time, no. But they're they're gonna have to make good on that promise for people. I mean, people have paid in their whole lives, you know, um, and that's why I think you know, with with a significant deflationary event. If, if they have the implementation of these other technologies, um, they will be able to print money in opposition to that. Yeah. Um, and then you could hold price stability for people and, and dole out money as needed and make good on those promises. Um, I know that's not the narrative that people want to hear. But, <laughs> what, it, yeah. but uh, this is the other thing, you know, people talk about Nassara Jasara uh, and, and wiping all these debts and like, restructuring and that's really what this is going to be and that's why blackrock is such a large player is because they are the best in the world at restructuring debt um but if, if you wiped out all the debt 
and just paid you, you just magically wiped it away okay um pension funds all of these people that that are banking on those payments because this is what people don't realize these these home loans and business loans and all these things that banks create they bundle those up and who do they sell those to the pension funds and other people that have to make monthly payments and they they pay they pay a depreciated uh, cash flow. Um, they depreciate the cash flows back to current value, and that's what they pay for those collateralized debt obligations um, that are packaged up. And you know, again, BlackRock has like worked that deal the, since the 08. Um, and they they take a lot of good debts and they stick some bad debts with it, so the whole thing doesn't default. And that's how they've like pushed this out as long as they have. Um, but now we're really in a, a fragile spot where we've hiked interest rates and nobody can refinance. Uh, and that's why you're seeing a lot of distressed properties and businesses go under right now. Uh, the people that can make it, uh, you know, we talked about earlier, I think that they're going to pivot and come back down a little bit, but yeah, um, I think they are. And um, <clears throat> because it's destroying the economy really um, from a perspective of, okay, as interest rates are high, okay, let's say you need a new car. All right. Well, inflation is already high. So you're pretty much left with, you're very tight on money. Now you're not going to want to pay a high interest rate. Your monthly payment on your car would be too much. So, uh, you're not going to get that car. And actually I'm keeping up with the car inventory and new inventory is actually sitting on the market for longer than it has in the past few years. Yeah. So they're struggling right now, new cars. Okay. And, um, some manufacturers are actually halting manufacturing on the newer vehicles for 2024 and 2025. Um, housing, you know, uh, people, they take out mortgage interest rates are high. Okay. Well, I discovered that it's been happening for a while now, but <clears throat> mortgage applications are on decline. Okay. There's less people. I mean, can't afford it. Yeah. They're like, I can't afford it or I'm just going to wait until interest rates come down so I can afford it. And um, that's affecting, you know, builders and inventory on the market. And it's uh, so they're going to have to lower interest rates to fix things. And well, uh, here, here's the antithesis loans. of that. Like, if they lower interest rates again, we're going to see a bull market in all those assets. And so property values really haven't adjusted uh, as much as they've needed to, to really make that meaningful for them to drop rates and people to be able to afford things again. Um, I, th I think we'll probably get another bull market in real estate. Um, I'm starting to see hedge funds and institutional players start to come back in the market uh, and make offers on things where they've been on the sideline uh, since about June or July of 21. Um, so that tells me that they think that the bottom's in, um, which is interesting. If, if people are waiting on lower real estate prices, I'm, I'm hesitant to believe that that's going to happen. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, I'm in the market for a new home too. So, um, you know, I would like them to come back down also interest rates and prices. Um, but yeah, I just, we'll see how it plays out. I, I don't, I'm hope that I hope that they pass the legislation that removes BlackRock and the other large institutions ability to come in and purchase single family. Uh, because that has driven the price up. Oh, yeah. Obviously, you know, they want to maintain those values because they purchased them high. They paid cash. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if they don't maintain that that value, then they're going to have unrealized losses on their books. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good point. And another data uh, point that I want to bring up, and there there's the data to back this up, that I discovered from an expert, there is... Um, an abundant supply of inventory of homes on the market, but only for people that um, have more money. But there's not enough supply for the average uh, income earner. Okay, that's the problem right there. There's well, enough for the rich and the wealthy people, but not enough for your average person and family to go buy a home. They can't afford it. No, and, and you're going to continue to see manufactured homes uh, and these, you know, 3D printed homes, I think is going to be huge because... Oh, yeah. Um, that reduces cost by one third and the production time um, also by a similar amount. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that can be, they can use different materials and other things. So 
Um, I anticipate that's probably the direction that housing will go, especially for single family is the production at scale of 3D printed homes. And that'll bring down the value that you're able to purchase a home at, you know, to something that's reasonable for the average yeah, person. Like a tiny home, like in San Antonio, yeah. the yeah. tiny homes, that's a big trend now. You you know why though, right? Yeah, well, people can't afford the normal home, so they just go buy it. And, and it's on wheels. So here's the other benefit of that. Uh, you don't have to pay taxes, uh, home taxes uh, or land taxes it's a, because- It's a truck. Yeah, it's, it's it rolls. It's not grounded. Um, you know, uh, RVs has become huge. We've seen an explosion in RV parks, uh, especially oh, yeah. with, um, you know, boomers retiring, selling their homes, and now traveling around in RVs. Uh, we've, we've got a couple uh, prefab fun homes. Pre yeah, prefab homes. Yeah. Clay Clayton Homes was a big move by uh, Berkshire Hathaway when they bought yeah. that company. Uh, they've done really well with that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think that trend will probably continue for the foreseeable future. Uh, we've, we've got a couple of fund partners that are acquiring, building, um, and maintaining um, RV parks, and they make there's a lot of cash flow on that, man. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, well, we've we've gone way over, and I, I want to respect your time and just say that I, I really appreciate oh, you being on here. I appreciate um, it, Jake. I, I enjoyed this conversation, my friend. We got to do this more. Yeah. I agree. This is good. And, we we can get Versan on here, too. Yeah. And actually, I forgot to mention, I'm looking forward to seeing you very soon. Max told me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be good. Um, well, I can mention that. So I, I don't have to tell him where it's at or any of those things. But um, so in the mastermind, we do have meetups. Uh, if you guys uh, want to know where that location is, um, get to come hang out with some really cool people. Uh, we would love to have you. The only uh, piece there is you need to connect with me on LinkedIn. That's how we verify people. And um, yeah, we'd love to have you know some of the audience here as participate in the mastermind, be able to get in on the private deals we run there, and then also some of the events. Um, like I said, if you guys haven't followed Bandel on his personal channel, uh, I think it was Vandell 33. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate Thank you. you bro. Yeah. Likewise. Um, um, well, like you said, I really look forward to seeing you there at the event. Um, well, I'll be there, man. Far. <laughs> not well, too far <laughs> this future. Um, forward to it. You think your brother can come up forward or no? I'm going to have to check with him. I'm okay. sure you, I'm sure he would love to. Yeah. Well, well, we'd love to have you both if, if you're all, if you all are able to attend. And um, yeah, like you said, we'll have to do this again. I'm happy to come on your channel. Um, we'll do it. Yeah. Time and um, yeah, look forward to continuing these. Sounds good, brother. All right, man. Appreciate well, thanks you. for having me, Jake. Uh, good talking to you as always, man. And uh, I'll chat with you soon. All right. Sounds good, brother. You have a good night. Right, and thank everybody night. in the chat for showing up. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good night, you guys. Y'all yeah. have a good night.